Good morning, Mount Calvary. Great to be with you today. It's wonderful to worship the Lord today. We're going to be taking a look at how we deal with doubts this morning. We probably all struggle with doubts in some way. So we're going to take a look at that topic this morning. For those of you who are joining us online today, we're thankful that you're in worship with us. Uh, inside your worship bulletin, for those who are in the house, we use the white connection cards for your prayer requests. Also, if you're new, you'd like to get connected here, please drop them off in the offering plate this morning. Let's begin with a prayer. I invite you to stand as we begin our worship. Father in heaven, how wonderful it is to know the love of Jesus Christ, that our Savior would die on the cross for us, that he would rise for us, that he so deeply loves us. In his name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pause for a moment of silent reflection. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done 
and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, for his sake, forgives us all our sins. Even Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring us peace in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Having this forgiveness from the Lord, we turn to one another and we share God's peace. And at this time, we want to invite the boys and girls forward for Mount Calvary. Kids, you may be seated as the boys and girls come forward. They can join Marcia and Laura on their way out to Mount Calvary Kids. Yeah. 
first reading for today comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. This is now the second letter that I am writing you, beloved. In both uh, of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by the way of the reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers, the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. But they're deliberating, uh, deliberately overlooking this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water through the water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world, uh, of these, the world that they uh, then existed uh, was deluged with water and perished. But the same word of heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought, uh, ought you to be in li lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening for the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which the righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ign ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the errors of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the gospel. Gospels from John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand is n and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, that they will listen to my voice. So there will always be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. 
we profess the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
us pray. Father, open up our hearts this morning to hear your beautiful words, to encourage and strengthen our faith. In the name of Jesus, amen. He is risen, but we sometimes struggle with doubts, right? Our faith sometimes struggles with doubts in many different ways and times. As long as you have faith, you're going to have some doubt. In my hand is a pink piece of paper. Now, some of you believe that there's a pink piece of paper in my hand, and others of you are not so sure. You're hesitant, right? Now, I'm going to do some work on your faith, okay? So hang in there. When I do this, I'm going to show you this. So take a look. What do I have? A pink, just as I said, just as I told you. But some of you are hesitant. You're like, I'm not so sure. The reason why your faith gets damaged when I show you is because now you don't need faith anymore. Faith is required only when you have some hesitancy. You have some doubts. But now that you see, now you believe. You don't need faith because knowledge had arrived. Doubting, though, is not the equivalent as unbelief. Doubting is situated in the balance between belief and unbelief. The hesitancy can actually help strengthen your faith if used in the right way. Your doubts can actually strengthen your faith if applied appropriately. You with me? Okay. So let's give you a few different examples as we work into this, and then we'll get into our text today. So first of all, uh, we all experience hard times, right? We all experience hard times. And during hard times, there's a couple of different things that we can say. We can, uh, first of all, it can drive us towards God or away from God. We'll go to the next slide here. Here we go. So during hard times, you can ask yourself this question, like, why God? How long, God? Like, what's going on? So that can actually drive you God. On the other hand, there's times where you can say, where is God? That's how Psalm 10 starts. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? So there's two different responses that we can have during difficult times or times of doubt. We can seek God or we can run away from God. A healthy response is to seek God. And that's where I want to drive you and help encourage you this morning. You see, processing your doubts is sort of like putting together pieces of a puzzle. Some of us put together puzzle pieces, uh, finding common colors. You put them all together and you can start with that. Others of you, you start with the borders. That's how you start to put the puzzle pieces together. Others, you find the corners and that's your starting point. When you are processing your doubts, chances are you have a starting point for how you're going to process your doubts. I want to encourage you to process your doubts pointing towards God. Direct your doubts working your way towards God. So as you're approaching your doubts, they can actually strengthen your faith. But you have to ask yourself, what's the motivation to your doubts? What's motivating you? In 1875... Uh, a German poet, Rainer Riker, was born, and he was a, a famous poet, and he said that your doubt can actually become a good quality if you train it. Your doubts can actually help you if you train it. Doubts will become one of the best workers, perhaps the most intelligent parts of you, if you train it appropriately. And several people in the Bible have hesitations and doubts. For example, in Mark chapter 9, We see in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and he meets a man who has a a son. He's mute. The man desires Jesus to heal his son who's struggling with this this, uh, demonic being that's causing him mute and goes into a fire. And the the father pleads with Jesus, and the father says, uh, the father of the child cried out to Jesus and said, I believe, help my Unbelief, famous verse in the Gospels. We can all probably pray that at different times. Now, Jesus heals the boy, 
And the man is worthy of, of having the man's son being healed, not because of his strength of faith, but because Jesus draws near to people that struggle in their faith. Jesus doesn't shy away from us when we struggle in our weakness and our doubts. In fact, Jesus comes closer to people sometimes who are doubting. There's a famous disciple in the Bible called Doubting Thomas. He's nicknamed that because he struggles with his doubts. Jesus comes to him after the resurrection, even after the other disciples had told him that Jesus had been risen from the dead. This is how uh, it's described. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see his hands and mark the nails and place my fingers into the mark of his nails, place my hands into his side, I will never believe. Thomas remained skeptical until he received tactile proof that Jesus had been risen from the dead. He's saying this, I, I won't believe unless I see the pink piece of paper. You with me? So his faith needed to be strengthened by seeing the visible evidence of Jesus' resurrection. Now, Jesus corrects Thomas later in that. He says, blessed are those who believe and haven't seen yet. So we're blessed by having faith, even though you haven't yet seen. Now, here's the point. Throughout the Bible, there are several people that have their doubts. John the Baptist has his doubts. is known as a doubter. Zechariah has his doubts. Jonah is wondering what's going on. Job has his questions. Throughout the entire scriptures, you can come across several people that have serious doubts about what's going on. So I want to dive into one particular person in the Bible today. And if you're worshiping with us at home, you need to grab a Bible and open it up to Psalm 73. For those of you who are worshiping here, Psalm 73 is on page 574. We're going to encounter a man named Asaph. Now, Asaph is an important person in the first half of the Bible. He's actually described as King David's choir director, or he leads the choir, if you will. In uh, the book of Nehemiah and 1 Chronicles, uh, Asaph is described as a man who leads a large choir, Psalm 50, Psalm 73, all the way through Psalm 83, so that would be uh, 12 of the 150 Psalms are attributed to Asaph. That would be 8% of the Psalms are attributed to Asaph. And Asaph is going to describe what's going on in his life in Psalm 73. And what I love about this Psalm is it is incredibly honest, it's very real, it could take place as much as years ago as it does today. So grab your Bibles. We'll get started and we'll learn about struggling with doubt, making room for doubt, and how to have a remedy for that doubt. Now you notice it, it's, it's described as a psalm of Asaph. So this is how we know it's Asaph's. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw prosperity of the wicked. For they had no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Therefore, his peoples turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would, be, would have betrayed the generation of your children. What's happening here? Notice in verse 2 what Asaph says. My feet almost slipped. I almost le lost my foothold. I love that Asaph is honest. What he's saying is, I almost lost my faith. I was struggling in my faith. 
And do you see why Asaph is struggling? He's leading people in worship. And yet he's saying, I'm struggling in my faith. Can you imagine that happening? Like Olga playing the piano and struggling with her faith? A choir director before thousands struggling with their faith? Man, I love this. Because the Bible's keeping it real for us. Asaph encourages me because this guy's real. He understands faith and how to have serious doubts. That you can have faith and doubts at the same time. If you're new to Christianity or have been following Jesus a while, this should be encouraging to you. That the Bible doesn't shy away from people who are struggling with their doubts or questions. But the Bible actually showcases them front and center so that you'd be encouraged and see how they process their doubts and struggles. The Bible includes people who are struggling with some big God questions. Throughout the Bible, people struggle with questions. And the good news is they're in here. Real people like you and me. They're in there to encourage us in our faith, to continue to walk it out. Asa shows us that it is possible to have faith and doubts to work things out through your God questions. So what's causing Asaph's faith to slip up here? Did you notice it? As the director of singers, he struggles when he sees wicked and unbelievers seem to fare off as well, if not better than everyone else. He, he says in verse 3, it's as if, how can God be God when wicked and evil people People are, are well-fed, they do well in life, and they do better than those who, are, who trust God, and those who trust God suffer. How does that make any sense? You see how he's working that through? What a question for today. Sounds just like today. In other words, like, how can God be God when, when bad people experience good things and the good people experience suffering? That's a question relevant for years ago as much as for you and me for today. That's what he's struggling with. It's a real question for us. It's a great question that many of us work through in our own lives. Maybe you're right here, right now, or you're worshiping online with us. You're like, man, that is a question that I'm working through. How does this make any sense? I know I'm not perfect, but I trust in God. I love Jesus, but my life is not working out very well right now. I'm experiencing some suffering. And yet those who despise God, they seem to be doing well in life. They increase their riches. They never seem to struggle. Everything seems to be working out for them. How does that make sense? So Asaph is considering this question. Why do bad people prosper while God's good people suffer? He continues to work that out, and he comes to some reflections in verses 16 and following. Let's take a look at that. In verse 16, he says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me weary, a wearisome task. In other words, man, this is hard work. Until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places, and you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, I was pricked in the heart. I was British and, uh, brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. See what's happening? He's making room for doubts, but as he's making some healthy room for doubts, he's working it out. He's reflecting upon what's causing these doubts. Not just that he has doubts, but why does he have these doubts? In your doubts, in your struggles, don't ask just why you have doubt, but go deeper. What's driving it? What's driving you to think and have your doubts? What's underneath it all? Sometimes we need to discern the answer. Asaph's answer to his question is that the wicked, they're going to face judgment. That will happen. If you take a look at verses 18 and 19. But he also discovered in verse 16 that having doubts is an exhausting thing. It's a wearisome task to continue to process this over and over and over and over again. Man, I'm tired. So Asaph is leaving room for some doubts. 
but it drives him to reconsider his own heart, his, the position of his own heart. Look at verses 21 and 22. He says, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in the heart, when I was brutish and ignorant, I was like a beast toward you. In other words, he said, I'm not even functioning like a human anymore, let alone a worship leader, a choir director. I'm functioning more like an animal. What's going on in my heart? Asaph needed to consider who he truly loved. Did Asaph love God because he thought he needed to get good things just like the bad people, or did he love God for just being God? Could he love God even while the wicked people prospered? Ladies, consider this hypothetical example. Let's say you are single. Some of you are. Let's say you are single, and in a week's time, Today, in fact, you find out that you are going to receive an inheritance from a trust fund. Not only that, but five days from now, your boyfriend is going to propose to you. Ask for your hand in marriage. In one week time, you go from poor and single to a trust fund baby engaged. Imagine the excitement. How excited would you be? Well, you're engaged, and a week before your big wedding day, you finally receive your inheritance from your aunt's trust fund. The check comes in the mail. You open it up in front of your fiancé, and it's made out to you, your name, no mistakes. It comes to a total of $5.25. Your fiancé's enraged. He's like, what's going on? I can't believe it. I, I'm not going to go through with this wedding anymore. And you say to your fiance, What's, why are you breaking up with me? Why are you breaking up with me? Don't you love me? He admits that he proposed to you only because of the trust fund. He thought you were a million dollar baby. You were his golden ticket. But now you're just as poor as him. And so the wedding's off. Similarly, Asaph's doubts only drive him to ask not just why good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people, but his doubts lead him to reflect upon why does he love God at all? Can he love God for who God is? Can you love God for who God is? Or do you only love God when you get the good things? Because you're a trust fund baby. Can you trust him in the bad days and the good days? Can you love him as God even when the diagnoses are bad and the outlook is bleak? Or do you only love him and worship him when the goodies come your way? Do you see what Asaph is wrestling with? He might as well be sitting here in our congregation. See what's going on? When you get down to it, Asaph is, is saying, God, I'm good pure in heart. I'm a pure in heart guy here. Meanwhile, evil people are getting all the goodies, and that doesn't make any sense. If you're such a good God, you should be giving me the good things. And there you have it. That's the core of Asaph's doubts and why his heart was grieved and his spirit was embittered. How can he be the worship leader over all of Israel, leading thousands and thousands in worship, when he only trusts God, when God gives him the goodies, but he can't trust God for God being God. Do you see it? Do you see how he's processing his doubts? Do you see how he gives us a template to work out our doubts, but still have faith to lean towards God, not unbelief, but to direct him towards God as you're working out your doubts and your struggles? Take a look at verse 3. Look at what Asaph says in verse 3. What drove Asaph's doubts? He says, for I envied. He envied the ignorant, the proud, the wicked, the prosperous people. Meanwhile, he kept himself pure in heart, down in verse 13. When he realizes the depths of his sin, he is grieved and is, he is embittered. He considers himself like a beast before God, not even a human. 
He's a beast. Now, I've heard some prayers of confession in my pastoral office, but no one has ever described themselves as a beast. You see, Asaph is repentant. He's turning back towards God. He sees his mistake. Then look down at verse 25. He says, and there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. There's nothing that you could give me, God, here on earth that would satisfy me. Everything that I want and I need is in heaven because that's where you are. Everything I desire is there. That's where you are. See how he's working out his doubts? At this point, he doesn't care if the wicked prosper. It doesn't matter to him anymore because everything that his heart longs for is found in the Lord. Do you see how it frees Asaph? You see how it can free you? See how it releases you? Asaph is finally experiencing good news. And that's where making room for doubt can be a good thing. For Asaph, his doubts help grow his faith. It makes him stronger and deeper. Now he's really the worship leader that God always wanted him to be for Israel. Do you see how making room for doubt can strengthen someone's faith? Now, I know most people are a mix of the two. They have faith, but they also have some hesitations. They have questions. That's fair. I'm a pastor. I've got some questions for God. I've got some big questions in a bucket for God. I've got some little questions in a bucket for when I see Jesus. Maybe this side of eternity, God will answer those questions. Maybe on the other side of eternity, Jesus will answer those questions. Maybe when God willing, I'm on the other side of eternity with Jesus. I won't even care about those questions. Right? All of us struggle at times. We have God questions. We have doubts. But we can have faith and trust the Lord in our doubts. One of my hobbies, especially when I was young, younger, is I would love to go to northern Maine and go white water rafting. Any of you ever gone white water rafting? Uh, you Got to do it. If you are worshiping at home, make that a summertime bucket list thing. When you go whitewater rafting, it is such an adrenaline rush for me. I love it. Here you are. You're in this rubber boat. Air is keeping you above the rapids. Think about that. And, and you're riding down these wild rapids. And I've been in some boats that have flipped. That is something scary. And then you see, like, your friend goes out of the boat. They're sucked down underneath the water. And, like, you're like, where did my friend go? And, like, 30 seconds later, there they are, 100 yards downstream. And you, here you are up, upstream, right? But I love it. It's such an adrenaline rush. But let's say the next time we decide whitewater rafting, you, you came whitewater rafting with me this summer. And I said, you know what? We're all going to go whitewater rafting. I'm kind of experienced. I've gone on the river once. <laughs> and I'm, I've got this smartphone. I've got Google Maps and satellite maps. Uh, we're good. I've gone down the river once. Do you trust me? Let's, let's get in the, we don't need the guide. Let's save some money. Tell the guide, take a day off. We're going down the river by ourselves, okay? But the guide says, no, 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 no. See, it doesn't work that way. You, you need me because there's parts of this river where there are, uh, there are unrunnable waterfalls. There are areas of the river that will suck you to the bottom of the icy cold water and you won't come up. You need me, the guide, to get you down this river safely. You've got to follow me. But, but most Americans prefer, like, directions and independence and control. And so you say, no, 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 I'll just take uh, the rubber boat, a paddle, and my phone, and we're, I'll be good. But you need a guide to get down the river, right? To safely get down the river. See, God is not big on maps. When God led his people out of Egypt, he didn't give them a map to get through the wilderness. Instead, the Lord led them through the wilderness, day by day by day. When Jesus invites his first followers to follow him, he didn't give them a map saying, well, on day 13, we're going to be here. Make sure you meet me here. Instead, he said, follow me. I'm your guide. Do you trust me? 
Put away your smartphone. Put away your procedures. Put away your maps. Trust me. Look at what Asaph says in verses 23 and 24. Asaph says, Yet I am always with you. That's what the Lord is saying. You hold me by my right hand. That's what God does for you. He's holding you. You guide me with your counsel. Afterward, you will take me into glory. See, what you don't need is a map. You need the Lord to be your guide. You need to hold him by your right hand to lead you and guide you. In your struggles and in your doubts, the Lord will guide you through your struggles. But trust him. Trust him in your doubts. And he will call you to him in glory, just as he called Asaph. Your remedy for doubt is to trust the God. It's to trust Jesus, who will get you home. Jesus is your God. He'll take you by the hand and lead you through your seasons of doubt and despair. To trust the God is to have a commitment to put away the map and to just go and follow the God in the, your daily life. To trust the God is to put everything away and to find everything that you have is in him. The earth with its maps and compasses and map apps, those will fade away. But Jesus is your God and your Savior who lives forever. You can trust in him. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, most of us probably gathered here here at Mount Calvary, for some who are gathered online, have struggled with doubts and questions and hesitations and things that we just can't understand. We can't get our head wrapped around it. Help us, Lord, to process our doubts, our hesitations in a healthy way, in a way like Asaph, that we dig deeper to what's driving the doubts, what's really the struggle. Help us to look below the surface, but also help us to trust that you are our Lord and Savior. You are our guide. You loved us so deeply that you went to the cross for our sins. You rose again to give us eternal life. Help us to trust in you, not to trust ourselves, but to trust in you, because you are our ultimate God. In Jesus' name we pray. At this time, we're going to continue with our offering. If you have your connection cards and you'd like to drop them off in the offering plate, that would be wonderful. We'll lift those up in prayer throughout the week and next Sunday.
dear friends in Christ, let us pray for God's people. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your resurrection power. You gave your precious life to save us. And we're grateful that you do not shy away from us with our questions and doubts, but you draw closer, closer to us. You grew close to Asaph and Doubting Thomas, and you draw close to us as well. By your loving kindness, you hear our prayers and strengthen our faith. Lord, we're thankful for the gift of relationships. We're thankful for Dave Reddick's son, Christopher, who is now engaged, plus his upcoming marriage and the relationship with Dave and Amy. Strengthen all marriages, wedding anniversaries, and bless our Mount Calvary marriage enrichment small group called Better Love. Uplift all of our relationships through the wonderful counselor, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. Comfort those who are experiencing serious health conditions. Uplift Teresa as she's experiencing chemotherapy for lung cancer and Sarah undergoing a second surgery for her cancer. Heal Jim and his hand recovering from surgery. Heal Carol's broken bone and provide her doctors to guide her in her health. Lord God, we ask for mercy for Earl suffering with sores. We ask for healing for Ruth and Ron's grandson, Tristan, for minor surgery. Give comfort and peace to those who are grieving. Lord, many of our friends need your tender care, and we ask for your hands of compassion upon all we name before you this morning. Gracious Lord, draw us closer that we might find in you forgiveness, peace, and healing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those who you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and to be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we ask you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit to faithfully eat his body and drink his blood as he invites us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. You alone. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed. As it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is a new testament in my blood, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord. 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 Thank you for the cross,
invite you to stand as we, together, we say a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in your holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith, the hearts of our pilgrim, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lord, his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. We've got a few announcements. First of all, uh, in the junior high room, after service, there's a Maine Seacoast Mission Information Meeting with Rob Webster. If you'd like to go up and serve the poorest county in New England, Washington County, it's right on the border of Canada and uh, the coastline in Maine. So if you want to learn more about that, go down to the junior high room after you get a cup of coffee today. We've got a couple other announcements. Joseph has an important one on VBS.
just sit down. They just laugh. Good morning, everyone. Hello. I'm, uh, I'm Ryan Self. Uh, that's for sure. For those who don't know me, uh, just wanted to give a quick uh, quarterly financial update. Uh, so we're trying to do these every quarter. So uh, we just went through the first uh, six or so weeks of March. Uh, so um, our first quarter, we our offerings were a little bit weak. We're about 18% under budget uh, for what we've mapped out, uh, which is around 30K. Uh, but we're hoping for much stronger second, third, and fourth quarter to help make up for the difference. <coughs> um, as I'm sure everyone's probably aware, offerings have to take a bulk of our income. Uh, we do have other income sources as well, but um, they're not as much as uh, the offerings, so we really depend on those. Also, our expenses were about on target, um, a few percent over budget, but pretty close to what we expected. And um, yeah, so uh, we're planning to give the next quarterly update uh, in July after the second quarter, and again, hoping for um, a stronger second, third, and fourth quarter. So we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. God's blessings on your week.